His Excellency, the President, ably represented by <laughs> the Honorable Minister of Information and Communication, who also doubles as the undefatigable government spokesman, Al Haji <coughs> Sahi Al Fakan. Ministers of government here present, ambassadors here present, our young and dynamic speaker, deputy speaker here present, is worship the mayor of the municipality of Fraser, I said to Kathy, I'm from 2050. The representative of the mayor of Franklin Township, distinguished Sierra Leoneans, ladies and gentlemen. I want to state that I'm really honored to be here today and to be asked to steer the proceedings for our evening. I want to thank all of you for sparing your precious time to be here this evening as part of the series of town hall meetings and dialogue sessions that have been organized by the government of Sierra Leone to be able to allow Sierra Leoneans to be briefed for what is happening back from the Sierra Leone, to be briefed about the MCC process related to incorporation, compact development process, and for you in the diaspora to also have the opportunity to make an input into this process. For far too long, things have been happening in Sierra Leone without the input of Sierra Leoneans in the diaspora. We have amended constitutions, we have prepared development plans after plans, we have even voted in and voted out leaders. But for those of you who actually bought your tickets and went out there to register and then to vote, most of you actually have never enjoyed that privilege. Things are changing gradually. Now you have got a session, but more importantly, we believe you also should have a say in some of these evolving development processes. And one of such is the MCC. So this evening, you will have the opportunity to listen to presentations on the MCC, but more importantly, you will be receiving a message from Mr. Excellency, the President, on how he feels about you and things happening here on you, and on how he wants people to be a part of the development process going forward. You will also have the opportunity to ask questions, primarily around the MCC process, but if there is any issue you will be here to seek clarification for, I think on this high table you have the representation of people who can answer all and any of your questions. So let me hope that we'll all find this coming a very useful one. And let me also hope that this will just mark the beginning of more fruitful engagement of this nation. I want to thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Chairman and Chief of Staff, colleagues of the Union, I want to thank you very much for sparing your time, very busy time, to come here this evening. I'm sure you are not here to listen to me. You are here to listen to whatever message the President of Sierra Leone must have said for you. But let me say that uh, this meeting was being planned so that it's excellent.
Excellency, the President of the Alice Bike Roma, who will spend a night here with you. The hotels we are booked, the halls we are booked, but nature has its own way of dealing with us under it. You make a plan one way, and there's a divine intervention that changes it. His Excellency, the President, had a minor accident whilst playing his uh, usual sports, squash, and that is why we were not able to come. We realized that we have a very large sector of the civilian population here in New Jersey, and that is why he planned to come here. He has asked me to tell you that that plan is still on, and in the very near future, we will be able to fulfill that dream to come and be with you here for a whole night so that you know that it's true father of the nation. Let me just say for one second uh, that the embassy in Washington is there for you. We've tried to make it very interactive. Those who have been going down there will appreciate that uh, there is a few changes that we have made to reflect the new thinking that we have in seven years. We are non-partisan. I have my own political party that I belong to, which everybody knows. But I am ambassador for seven years, and not ambassador for eight years. So be you SLPP, be you PLC, be you APC, feel free to call at the embassy whenever you need our services. We are there to serve you, and we are there to work on behalf of seven years. So once again, I want to welcome you and hope that uh, we will all sit patiently. And like the chairman said, feel free to ask any questions. There are competent people on this table and even on the floor to be able to answer some of the questions that you might have. So once again, I welcome you all to this August evening. It's of Sierra Leone, welcome to New Jersey. I'm here to tell you a little bit about the MCC, which stands for the Millennium Challenge Corporation, a US-based entity that is leading the fight against global poverty. This MCC thing is not new to some of us. In fact, uh, we had our first meeting in 2007 at the house of a fellow competitor who's here today, Mr. Jis Bensuma. And, uh, he hosted us for the first meeting at the very time that we were having elections in Sierra Leone, that very weekend, September 8, 2007, as you can remember. We also have with us Mr. Melbourne Gaba, who was also at that meeting, where we thought that, uh, can you please stand up so we can see Where we thought that uh, Sierra Leone should uh, pay attention to this MCC exercise, regardless of who was to come into office. When, in 2008, a presidential task force was formed, it was headed by no other than the Honorable Al Haji Al Babakar Saeed Kanu. Mm -hmm. Also on that team was Dr. Richard Conte, our able chief of staff today. However, we did not have enough good data to make any impact to be noticed by the Millennium Challenge Corporation. Fortunately, we were, God gave us a president like Anis Bai Guruma who, with his visionary leadership, has been able to impact our country in a good way with regards to good governance overall. So, the MCC came knocking on our door last year after we passed 12 indicators. In fact, we passed five indicators in one year, unprecedented. No other country has ever done that. In the so I feel proud to stand here today as a member of the Millennium Challenge Coordinating Unit from Sierra Leone that was formed in late January of this year. Um, we have with us members of the team. Mr. Mahmoud Idris is our able coordinator. He was appointed directly by the President of Sierra Leone to lead this, uh, this uh, team. We also have with us our gender specialist, 
Mrs. Napista Tujalo. <laughs> Sitting next to her is another youth, Ms. Memuna Tufona, one of our economists on the team. And we have, sitting next to her, Mr. Wilbon Charles, also another economist on the team. <laughs> the MCC of the diaspora can bring to our country. On that note, I would want to pass the mic back over to my chief of staff, and uh, we look forward to talking to you again. Thank you very much, Mr. Amadou Masale. Come on, let's go to the Lolo. I now want to invite Mr. Mamu Idris to make his presentation. We, as a team, have been commissioned by the government to do what it takes to get to the point of signing what is known as a compact agreement between the government and the MCC. And I'll explain later what a compact really is. But beyond explaining about the MCC and what it does, I'll explain a little bit, don't mind them, um, uh, they'll sort it out, sorry. I will explain a little bit about the, the analytical processes that we have gone through at the MCC, um, where we are now, and where we hope to move in the coming weeks and months. But then, above all this, one of the things we want to achieve, and that has been one of our principal objectives going all around the different states and talking to different groups of Syrians, is to find a way to establish a mechanism, a platform, a system through which we can all share ideas, we can get your views, we can get your opinions, we can get your contributions and your participation in the MCC. You must understand that you're not just any other stakeholder. The Sierra Union population in the United States is a very important stakeholder in the MCC process for many reasons. First off, you are all very smart people, so it means that you can contribute meaningfully towards the planning and even the implementation process. But more importantly, many of you are working in this country and you are paying taxes. The Millennium Challenge Corporation is an agency of the U.S. government, which means that the programs it funds in developing countries is from taxpayers' dollars. And so it is also very important that for what it's worth, you are aware of what these dollars are being used for and that they, there's enough value for money. So these are the three broad objectives. I want to explain what this MCC is about, that Sierra Leone has been declared eligible for a compact what are the steps that we would have to go through to reach the state of actually benefiting from the grants? What are the analysis we've done to date? And what are the next steps that we'll be taking? But then get your views about how we're going to engage and stay engaged throughout this process. A little bit about the MCC. Uh, there is a statement there that says it's a United States agency that promotes global development to reduce poverty. But in, in, in simpler terms, this is an agency that was set up in 2004 by the US government to come up with a new way of doing business as far as providing development aid is concerned. Of course, all of us are aware that the United States has many agencies before the MCC that has been involved in providing development aid, USAID, and many of them. In, in the investment front, they have the OPIC. But the MCC was set up to provide finance, grants, aid, technical support to developing countries that are doing well in, the, in certain areas of governance. So they have several indicators they come up with in three broad categories. They have the category that looks at issues of ruling justly or good governance. They have a category that looks at economic freedoms and what is known as investment in citizens. They have 20 indicators that they use to measure the performance of not just Sierra Leone, but many countries that are less developed in a similar income bracket. 
So they have indicators like how much is the government spending to improve on healthcare in the country? How much is the government spending of its resources on education? Education for vulnerable groups like girls. How much is the government spending on, on programs that support human development? What are the laws that the government is putting in place to make it easier for people to invest their time and their resources? Ease of doing business, access to credit. What is the government doing to make people's voices heard? Civil li liberties, political rights. So there are 20 of these indicators that they measure the performance of a country against others. And so if you do well as compared to your peers, you pass that indicator. So Sierra Leone has come a distance over the years. We've passed in certain years, six, seven, eight. But then in 2012, something dramatic happened as a result of a significant push by the government of Sierra Leone across many fronts. The free healthcare program, for example, and the government resources that were allocated to support that program. We have a lot of reforms that made it easier to do business and access to credit in Sierra Leone. Sierra Leone has been consistently ranked high compared to its countries in the area of civil liberties and political rights. So as a result of passing 12 indicators, the government was informed that they qualified to receive a grant. There are two types of grants typically that the MCC provides to countries. We have what is known as a, as a threshold grant, which is a smaller, small size grant provided to countries that are doing well on the path of good governance and doing well in other indicators. So you're not quite there yet, you're not excelling, but you're on the right path. So they provide smaller size grants known as thresholds to support these countries so that they move in the right direction. But for those countries that seem to be doing particularly well across the different indicators, they provide what is known as compact grants. Compact are relatively large sized grants. Um, it has ranged from, from in, in the past, something to $60 million in some countries to five, six hundred million dollars in other countries. So for a country like Sierra Leone, given the size of our GDP and even government revenues, a compact grant means a lot and it will mean a lot. So that is why the government has put a lot of importance to the process of moving this process of signing a compact with the MCC to the front. But there is there is a difference, there is a lag between saying a country is eligible for a compact grant and actually starting to receive the grant from the MCC. So there are processes that we have to go through as a country and I'll just explain that. This slide should help us understand. There are five, five distinct, discrete stages that we have to go through. The first stage involves doing the setup, having the people that will do the work and all of that kind of thing. So we have a team that we call the Millennium Challenge Coordinating Unit, which is operating under the auspices of the Chief of Staff. But then, after that, we have to do what is known as the preliminary analysis. Three types of analysis we have to do. We have to do what is known as the economic constraints analysis. What this means is we have to look at our economy and try to understand what are the most serious problems that prevent you, I, or any other private person or agent from investing their time and their resources. But for even those that are investing their resources, what is kind of limiting the, the, the level of return that they potentially stand to gain? So these are what are known as constraints economic constraints, the things that hinder investment, but then also reduce return on investment for those that are operating and investing in the economy. Apart from the economic constraint, we also 
conduct what is known as social and gender analysis. The issue of gender and social inclusion or exclusion is very important in many less developed countries. The reasons are obvious. Many of these countries have operated or their, their cultures, their societies are structured in a way that disadvantage certain segments of society, whether it's women, poorer segments, or poorer categories, disabled people, people with less voice, etc. So we tried to understand how, what are the dynamics of social inclusion and even the gender imbalances. The ultimate goal is, if you're coming up with a compact like this, you don't want a, a project like that to reinforce these imbalances, so that if you understand how these dynamics occur, you can correct for them at the point of designing or implementing the compact. We also did what is known as investment opportunity analysis. What is the legal environment, investment climate like? What are the laws? What are the regulations? How conducive and friendly are they for private investments? What are the market opportunities? Potential return on investment for the private sector that want to go in. What are the productive sectors like? Which areas kind of are driving the economy in Sierra Leone? All of these things we look at under the investment opportunity analysis. More recently, we're even looking at what, at what are the opportunities for private and public partnerships. So all of these analysis put together is what we go through in stage one. Once we complete stage one, these analysis help us understand what are the problems as far as the economy is concerned and private investments and social and gender issues. We move to stage two, which really looks at trying to put together a set of activities and projects that should solve the problem of the constraints that we identified. So if we say human capital is really the biggest problem or one of the biggest problems constraining private investments and return on economic activity in the country, then what set of programs or projects should we put together to address this human capital problem? If we say it's infrastructure, what set of projects? That is known as the project definition stage. Now, once we put all of these project ideas together, if it sells and flies with our partners at the MCC and their management, kind of okay, then we move to the next stage, which really looks at more detailed, what they call feasibility analysis, environmental, social health impact analysis, etc. I mean, all of this makes sense because if you're doing a very large project, you need to study like the costs so that you don't start thinking it will cost 10 million, but then it ends up costing 35 million. You want to understand if you're doing infrastructure projects, for example, what are the implications on the environment, on communities that may have to be relocated, on groups that may have to be affected socially, even economically. So stage three really tries to understand the full details of whatever it is we will be doing under this compact. And then the subsequent stages really are the formality stages, negotiating the compact based on all the findings from phase one to phase three, signing an agreement, setting up the institutions that will be responsible for implementing these projects. So basically, these are the five steps that have to be taken. Right now, we are we just completed phase one and we're moving into phase two. Chief mentioned that we were in, in DC for about a week conducting workshops. These workshops should help us start defining the projects when we get back to Freetown. Now there is a frequently asked question, well, when should we start expecting these monies now? They have said this, you have done all of this analysis. When will the money start coming? The MCC has been around for close to 10 years now, which means that they have developed compacts and they have implemented compacts in many countries around the world, Africa, Latin America, Eastern Europe, and other places. So there is an experience, and based on that experience, this five-stage process that we should go through, on average, 
has taken 27 months. Some countries have done it for a lot shorter period. Others have taken a longer time to do it. But on average, it takes about two years to get to that stage when, as we say, the money actually starts coming. But because, as a country, we understand that we don't have the luxury of time as far as you know, moving these developmental programs forward, we're, make, we're making best efforts, best, best test efforts, to really get this thing done as quickly as possible, below the average time is taken. All right, so that is it for, for the processes that we have to go through, and of course, we'll all have time to ask questions later if, if anything is not clear. But let me just take you through some of the conclusions and findings of the analysis that were done, constraints, social investment opportunity. <clears throat> There's a very busy slide there, but don't, don't mind it. it. It basically is saying that the diagnosis we did on our economy to understand what are the biggest problems kind of looked at many different areas. So all of those small boxes you see on the slide um, are the different areas that we tried to examine and test them, if at all any one or many more of those ones um, are posing constraints to economic activity. We looked at issues of finance, market failures, micro risks, macroeconomic risks, infrastructure, natural capital, human capital, many of them. And after looking at them and doing the analysis based on a, a certain methodology, which is generally accepted as a diagnostic, economic diagnostic methodology, here are some of the things. One is that the inadequate supply of electrical power is a very serious constraint to investment in that country. <clears throat> in this day and age, there's not, there aren't many businesses or investments that you can do without electricity. Everything now is computerized. Even now you want to get a simple assembly line to process water. It's linked to a mainframe that kind of process, does all the calculations and everything. So you can't do any form of investment without electricity. So we found out that the inadequate supply of electricity is affecting investments in many ways. First of all, if you don't have a generator as a business, you can't survive. A recent survey done showed that eight out of every 10 businesses in Sierra Leone either own or share a generator. What that means is you can't just go and start a business hoping to hook up to a grid. In, in your business planning, you need to make arrangements for a backup generator. So that in itself is a constraint. You have cases where those without generators, every time the outage goes, they can't produce. So in areas like the provincial areas, they have generators, the generators break down, loss of output. Problem number one. Constraint number two is that the core road network in the country is constrained in economic activities in two ways. One, limited access to bring output or commodities to the market. We, we live in an economy that the GDP itself is driven by agriculture, 60, 50% or thereabout. So most of these agricultural activities take place in the rural areas. So if you live in an economy in which the roads themselves kind of limit access in these rural areas, then it's difficult, even with the small output, to bring them to market. So you have cases of harvest losses and post-harvest losses. But then there's also the issue of higher transportation costs, which kind of really reduces the competitiveness of businesses that are operating in rural areas. The third constraint is the poor water and sanitation conditions. I'm sure many of you here go to Freetown every now and then, and then it's something, maybe I'm saying the obvious, but of course the data was there to support it. This one constrains economic activity, again in two ways. One, or even kind of reinforces the poverty situation. People are generally poor, and then there's a high incidence of waterborne and water-related diseases. This means 
that the small monies they have in their pockets, they have to spend on treating these diseases. But then added to that is the fact that when you're sick, you can't work. And in our cases, when people are sick, they need others to attend to them. So it's most likely not going to be a nurse in the hospital, it's going to be someone at home who's maybe taking time off business or work to attend. So that's, in economic terms, is lost productivity. <laughs> a cross-cutting problem we noticed is that there seems to be a, a problem of weaknesses in policies, and even where there are the policies, the weaknesses in the institutions that need to implement and enforce these policies and laws kind of reinforce most of the other constraints. So there's a problem, but then the problem is made worse by the fact that the institutions cannot even implement the little policies and regulations that are there. So, and it's not just across the three sectors identified. Now, when we did this analysis, we took a tour nationwide as we're doing now in the US, it's five states, but in Sierra Leone we covered all the 12 districts, just to get a feel of what the people thought about this one. It was kind of consistent with our findings. Um, the only, in the, the ranked the situation of roads as a most, the most serious problem, followed by power, followed by water, and then of course the institutional ineffectiveness. I, I talked about the investment opportunity analysis and I'll say this in summary. One, that the business and investment climate in Sierra Leone may not be the best at the moment, but it has come a very long way from where it was, say, five, six years ago. At the moment, Sierra Leone is consistently being ranked very high as far as how friendly it is to investors and how easy it is to do business, and more recently, even the ease of access to credit. More recently, the Credit Reference Bureau was established as a way of enhancing um, the risk. Productive sectors are driven by agriculture and mining, but there are strong opportunities also in the area of agro-industry and services and infrastructure. More recently, there, there has been, a PPP unit has been established in the office of the president, supervised also by the chief of staff, that is kind of looking at opportunities where the private sector can come in and partner with the government to implement those projects that the government can otherwise and I must say that these PVP opportunities are many and they are even evolving. On the social and gender analysis, um, a number of conclusions, findings. One is that, you know, the whole pluralistic legal systems we have in the country kind of creates problems and challenges for certain segments. In some cases, women, in some cases, um, children. There are challenges of access to credit and finance, particularly also by women, tied to the issue of collateralization, tied to the issue also of security of tenure and property rights, inheritance, devolution of estate. All of these things, the way the laws are structured, they, they're done in such a way, it seems to favor men more over women, or even where it's not per se favored, the kind of practices enforce or re reinforce this situation. Other social issues of education and health, we also observe that a little lopsidedness of the system, women or girl children, even despite policies of free education for girl children and government expenditure to promote education of girl children, cultural practices still kind of keep them out of the classrooms. Now, having said that, where are we moving from here? As I said, we're going to put together the project ideas. We're going to submit them to the MCC, and if they are approved, we're going to do the feasibility studies and hopefully get the compact signed. That is going to be done as quickly as possible. Now, finally, why all of these discussions? Why need all these people around? Why come and talk to me? Three things. One. Of course, we need to get your views, as brief as they may be, on what we have just done. We have done an analysis that says there are several problems that are constraining private investment, and I mentioned them. 
But what are your views on this? Do you have other kinds of views? The second is, how can we really start engaging? Because this is a process that is going to take five years and more. And we hope to optimize it. Your contributions are very important, but it has to be structured, the engagement. So we need to know. We've had views from all the other uh, unions we spoke to in the different areas. And we're, we're going to come up with a, a structure. But again, we need to hear from the very wise people of New Jersey. How are we going to engage and stay engaged? How will we get your views? How would you know what we're doing? How can you contribute to this process? Third, and most important, how is it that the Sierra Union diaspora can really organize to take advantage of what is going on now in the country with the MCC so that they can contribute, add their own to help reduce poverty and stimulate growth in Sierra Leone? So these are the discussions, at least for us at the MCC, we want to engage with you in this session. As best as you can answer these three questions for us or address them, they will help our mission. In, in New Jersey and the United States. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much, Mr. Mahmoud Idris, for this presentation. Please reserve your questions. You will have the opportunity to ask after His Excellency the President who is ably represented here by his own very spokesman has spoken. But for us to be able to fully understand and appreciate who this person is that is stepping to the shoes of the president, we have in our midst someone that knows him very well. And the, that person is his own very spy. <laughs> Good evening, New Jersey. Mr. Chairman, good evening. And I kindly ask, please allow me to stand on the existing protocols. <coughs> My task, ladies and gentlemen, is to introduce the keynote speaker of this event. This fine gentleman is no small man. He's a man who is well known, well regarded, well respected, in the country locally and in the diaspora. His ability to convey information concisely, precisely, and eloquently is second to none. In fact, what he intends to speak about here this evening is something the president should have been doing. Well, he was there where those arrangements were being made. In fact, he was part of that arrangement. Very modest, but yet an intellectual powerhouse, secured both his bachelor's degree as a mining engineer and his MPhil as a geophysicist from the University of Nottingham, a world-renowned university in the UK. Came back home after studies and taught in what is known as the Fra Bay College in the Geology Department. At the same time, was a businessman, and then he entered politics. As a politician, he advocated for the rights and for the livelihoods of his people with integrity. He served the Sierra Leone Parliament for a while. This fine gentleman, our keynote speaker, 
did everything in his power. Worked as a team player. Supported our president. And they were able to move from opposition to government in office. It may interest you to know that he was the first minister that was assigned. And he was there with the president, put the bricks and put the motto, playing around with the sand and the cement, figuring out how much glue we should put, figuring out how to tighten the knot and bringing all the apparatus together that is today responsible for the success we see in Sierra Leone. He served as the Minister of Presidential and Public Affairs. He contributed to the establishment of what is today known as the OGI, Open Government Initiative, an agency that the President uses to show transparency and allow the people of Sierra Leone to connect with the three arms of government. He was also highly instrumental in the establishment of the ABC, the Tichiro Bureau Change Secretariat. He was also there in the conduction of the ODA, Office of Diaspora. And while he was there, it was in fact the first focal point of the MCC. I can remember vividly one of three, one of two visits that we made to the MCC in Washington, D.C. He stood up at a town hall meeting and asked the administrators, after all those other countries that have been considered for a compact or a threshold had been called and Sierra Leone's name was not there, he stood up and he said, you know, my name is such and such. I would like to ask you a question. We have done everything possible. We have done everything you've asked us to do to make sure we're in conformity, to make sure we're in line with your expectations. But it's been three years and Sierra Leone has not been called. Is there anything we need to do? That provoked a meeting the following day with Mr. Johannes, who is the CEO, and a lot of the other technology, uh, technocrats down there. And it was after that meeting that I heard, that you heard, that everybody heard, about eight months later, that Sierra Leone is now being considered, not for a threshold, which is the initial point, but for a compact. I think he was highly instrumental in pushing the case for Sierra Leone. Ladies and gentlemen, after having served in the Ministry of Presidential and Public Affairs, our keynote speaker was reassigned to the Ministry of Mines and Mineral Resources. There again, he performed monthly, put together the laws that today regulate and guide our extractive industry. After having done his bit, he was then reassigned to the Ministry of Political and Public Affairs, where he served as the CSO, where he provided a face for the public, allowed the public to be able to interact with government. This is how it will affect our people on the ground. After the 2012 elections, he was again reassigned to now the Ministry of Information and Communication Technology. And in that ministry and government, he's also the official government spokesman. And he's also carrying the title he's been carrying since 2007, which is the one and only presidential 
spokesman. So ladies and gentlemen, it is not by mistake that the president has asked that your keynote speaker be here to deliver his thoughts, to deliver his sentiments. He has been there, he has been a part of, he will be a part of, and he is a part of. So without much ado, ladies and gentlemen, let me now take the opportunity to call the name of this indefatigable, this eloquent, this articulate, this perceptible, this gentleman that is ubiquitous <laughs> in his generosity. A man that is well known for his silver tongue. Without much ado, please put your hands together for the Honorable Alaji Alpha Bakar Sajikana. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Aji Vijayalam. After that introduction, I think it will pass for the keynote address. <laughs> I will now attempt to dot the I's and cross the T's. Mr. Chairman, Chief of Staff of the Government of President Dennis by Corona. Your Excellency, the Ambassador of Sierra Leone in the United States of America, Canada, and all of South America, including yeah. the Caribbean. My colleague, Minister of Youth, the Deputy Speaker of Parliament, my colleague, the Deputy Minister of Finance and Economic Development, who is also part of this delegation. Our oversight parliamentarian, represented here by Madam Honorable Aisata Kapia of the Sierra Leone Parliament and the African Union Parliament. The ambassadors of Ethiopia, the ambassador, deputy ambassadors in the permanent uh, representative's office in New York, deputy ambassador in Washington, D.C., my colleague, C., special executive assistant to His Excellency the President, all the members on the high table, and those that are not on the high table but are equally distinguished and recognized. Good evening. His Excellency the President Ernest Bai Koroma would have loved to be here. But as you know, man proposed or disposed. However, he's here in spirit with you. He's asked me to first of all tell you that he considers you a very important part of his administration, part of the country, i.e. the diaspora. As the Deputy Minister of Finance did say, this is the first place he came to, and his potential to be leader of Sierra Leone was recognized by the government of this Franklin County. We want to thank that government. Uh, first, to know that in this man is a potential president, so they gave him all the topics that he needed as a minister in his days when he visited as a, as a leader of the opposition. So we thank the government, the council, my uh, attention is just been drawn. I think, uh, like I said, the uh, man who introduced me took so much time. I'm Russian, so I don't waste your time. I have forgotten a very important duty. The introduction and salutation of the mayor 
of the municipality of Freetown. I am um, Buddy Gibson. Yes, the president thinks of you, diaspora, very important. And I tell you why. When we were at war, something must happen before somebody knows your wealth. So, oh, they're people in the end and then they can. But it was good you didn't go. Because we all have been in the same point and nobody to rescue. You were here sending the small monies. You were here sending the food. You were here sending the support. When all the world made an embargo against us, there was nothing going into Freetown, nothing going into Sierra Leone. All the banks were closed, nothing happened. Only the diaspora remittances kept the country going. Without you, without you, we would not have been able to prosecute that war. We would all have given up and run away to him. But thanks for staying here and looking after us. So now we as politicians will realize that if the diaspora are vexed by you, very unlikely that you will win the presidency. That is why President Kuma sent us to talk to you, our fifth region in Sierra Leone. We are here to talk about the MCC, the Millennium Challenge Corporation account, that we are very likely to win an award this year. There are 183 countries in the world. I think about 103 of them are classed as developing countries. We are in that. Among that 103, Sierra Leone has been selected as having been made eligible through the governance of its uh, president to put in a program for a compact. I think that is a big achievement in the world, and I think you deserve a round of applause for yourself. So the MCC is an effect. In Creole, they say, no look aside for them. Look aside for your foot. The MCC Compact Award did not come by accident. But as a result of the deliberative actions of President Koroma, to answer those questions, that the world looks for to do those things that the citizens expect to improve their lives. That is why he has been rewarded. Rewarded, I say, to prepare a program for a compact world. That is the cause. That is the effect. The cause is what? The cause is that when President Kuruma accepted your verdict that he had won the elections in 2007, and that he should be sworn in as president of Sierra Leone, he decided to introduce into his government a scientific approach. Scientific approach to governance. What do you do? For some of you, who studied science. You know that they say the basis of science is based on three principles. Observation, experimentation, and measurement. President Kuruma spent the two, the, all of the period he had in parliament as leader of the opposition observing. Observing the things that were wrong in Sierra Leone. The things that were wrong in the governance of Sierra Leone. The things that were not reaching the people. Revenue from the minerals that was not being used to build the roads. To build the road from Ruberi Junction to Pamla. The revenue that was not being used to conclude Bumbuna Hydroelectric. The revenue that was not being used to improve on the agriculture and give the farmers the tools they needed. So that's one given. He observed that in Sierra Leone, we had the worst statistics in terms of the development statistics. On the Human Development Index, we were the last for many years, for over a decade. Why was that? 
because human development is not measured by how many skyscrapers you have in the country or how many four wheel drives you have or Mercedes Benz you drive in the country, but by how much or how many of your people have access to basic amenities. How many people have access to good roads? How many people have access to food? How many people have access to electricity? All of these things. So that made us the worst. But the worst of the statistics that will make anybody bleed for the country was the one that Sierra Leone for a very long time was rated as the country where it was the worst to be a woman of childbearing age. The chances of that you might die given life. 867 women out of 100,000 would die given birth. It was also the worst place to be a child. 267 of our children would die out of every thousand, over 26% before the age five. President Kuruma observed. He looked at the why and then looked for the how. Why was this, he said. This is because of access to health. The facilities existed, but the cost of access was very much prohibitive for a lot of people. People would die because they didn't have 50,000 euros to pay a doctor for an operation for a cesarean. The woman would die. So he looked at the vulnerable groups and said, let me remove the cost of access to health for the most vulnerable groups, i.e. the pregnant women, the suckling mothers, and children under five. This is how, from 2009, sorry, 2009 years to 2011, our figures in terms of infant mortality and maternal mortality reduced greatly by over 60%. I know it stands today not at 867, but at about 450, 100,000 for women. Still there. Now. But we are not at the bottom of the rung anymore. Children, no longer 267 of them will die out of 1,000, somewhere between 140 and 150. We're still trying to push it down. President Kuruma has succeeded reducing those figures. And then, of course, the access to electricity. A lot of you have been to Sierra Leone. The roads you've seen the construction. You can now go from Mashiaka to Bo and back into Freetown in time for you to go and pray Fajr. I mean, the uh, uh, Fitiri in the, the, the mosque. And before it wouldn't happen, you needed seven hours to traverse from Mashiaka to Bo. But now, you can go to go from Freetown in under three and a half hours. You are witnesses to that. You can leave Freetown, go to Conakry and back in the same day now, before you needed two days to get to Conakry. You are witnesses to that. Those are the results of good stewardship. Those are the results of a man who is determined to move his people from poverty and put them among the community of nations. It's because of that that the American government, through the MCC, noticed that this man is doing the right things. That is why, as you saw the figures which Mr. Mahmoud Idris gave you there, all those years he was talking about, 2007, 2008, 2009, 2010, I was head of the task force for the MCC. We managed seven passes in 2008. We managed eight in 2009. We dropped to six because then we were putting the things together to make an effect. In 2010, we came back to seven. Sorry, in 2011. Well, 2012, a concerted effort by everybody in the government, ministers, MDs, everybody, made sure that we passed 12 of those. And 12 of those, I think, was the highest number that any country passed in that year. That is why we moved from nothing, not into a threshold, but into conversation for a compact. That is the effect for the cause, the 
causative factors I have just given you. Good government, concentration and focus. That is what President Kuruma did. So what did he do? He put together a strategy. After observing, he knows that he needs a strategy, a method, to get to his results. And the method was what? So let me affect, affect energy. Let me do agriculture. Let me do infrastructure. Let me do human development. When you put all these things together, for some of you who are religious, if you look back, especially those who are Christians and are familiar with the Bible, if you go to Genesis chapter 1, you will see that it is almost similar to the Almighty, the Creator's own priorities for the earth and the Creator. Because in Genesis chapter 1, it says that on the first day after God made the earth, He said, Let there be light. So the first thing was energy. Priority number one. Priority number two. Now I have light. I can see that this earth that I have made is not beautiful. It's ugly. It has no form. So now let me separate the firmament from the sea, the mountains from the valleys. Let me make it beautiful and put lights in the skies. That was infrastructure. The next step was what? Maybe one day I shall make man. But man needs to be fed, not like me and God. I don't eat or depend on food. But the man, when he comes, the first thing he says is hungry. So let me throw the seeds in the land, in the, in the fields. And the animals in the forests. And throw the fishes in the water so that when the man comes, he has food. That was agriculture. And the next step is death. Now everything is ready. The earth is beautiful, there is light, there is food. God said, let me make man. So, human development in this case is development in education and health to ensure that the children no longer die as much as they do, as many as they did before 2007. No longer will the women die as many as they did before 2007. Preserve it in their life. Leads to human development. So once that is done, President Goroma wins the compound. He sets up a good team, headed by the minister, former minister of trade and industry, now the chief of staff. He looks modest, but he's not, you know, he's our boss. He's the one who coordinates all our activities. But uh, he, he would go far. He's a man who not get, doesn't get carried away with his importance. But he's our chief of staff. Is the one through whom we speak to the president on official matters. He is ahead of us, and I am very pleased with the way they have been moving, because I am very familiar with the steps that you need to go through before we get to combat. And from uh, inside information I had when I was in Washington a few days ago, I was told that there might be a possibility that Sarah might break the record of actually signing a compact within a year of uh, having been. Uh, uh, awarded uh, as to prepare a compact. So we must clap for the team. <laughs> so when all that is put together, we now see that President Kuruma now has the strategy to get us where we want to go. Sorry, I did not tell you about the aim. The aim of President Kuruma is to meet the Millennium Development Goals. When you meet the Millennium Development Goals, at least you've moved your people from poverty. You would have had hunger, you would have reduced uh, literacy, uh, illiteracy uh, by 50%, you would have reduced infant and maternal mortality death, you may have reduced the HIV prevalence rate, which we have actually, because in 2009 in Sierra Leone, we were the people who received uh, Millennium a development goal award from the UN for the efforts the country was putting together to reduce the HIV AIDS pandemic rate of penetration. And that was, it now stands at about 1.5% and going down. I don't think it's increasing at all. So we've done well in that. So those are the aims. So he got the observation, saw, got the aim, the MDGs. The next thing is the experiment which is the agenda for change I've just told you about. Then the final thing is the results. 
I measure. How do you know you are getting there? That is why the MCC became important to us. The MCC we went there not primarily not for the money in it. We went there because it provided a set of scientific ways of measuring our progress on an annual basis. That is why we kept a keen eye on the scorecards every year they come out, because then I was able to know whether Dr. Richard Conte and his deputy Mavinti Darami were doing well in terms of doing business capital, because they tell us in those ways. They will tell us whether the Ministry of Health is doing well. They will tell us whether us in the Public Affairs Ministry and the Political Ministry we're doing well in terms of civil liberties and giving voice to our people. Free of speech. So the Millennium Development Goal, sorry, the NCC scorecard became our own milestones every year to check where we were going. When we had a seven in 2008, what happened? Those who get it. And then we got an 8 in 2009. And then 2010 we went down to 6. You know why? Because everybody started thinking about the elections that were coming. So people took the foot up the pedal. But then President Koroma put fire behind us again. Said, look, if I don't get a threshold at least by 2011, we'll run the fire. So everybody got busy. And that year we got 12. So we did not only go to a threshold, we had double promotion. We went straight to a compact. No country has done that before. You first go from zero to a threshold, and the threshold into a compact. We went to a compact. And now, with the team headed by uh, 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 Richard Conte and uh, Idris, we are very likely that by December this year, we'll be invited to do an assessment that might decide. They might decide for us to put our, our projects. And I hope for that. Once you get to that point, you can start counting the projects that you're going to do. So now, once we have got that, we've got the measurement. So that is why I said President Koroma's approach to development is scientific. First, you observe. You know what's wrong. The status quo. Then, what do I do to change this? come with a strategy. That was the agenda for change. And then how do I know that in these five years I've done so well? Then you look for a yardstick. The yardstick is what? The yardstick is the MCC scorecard. Because it's developmental oriented. But it also gives you an opportunity for self-assessment. And we use that. And today we're very thankful that that result has been recognized not only by the MCC giving us a, a compact award in December of last year, but also by you and the people in Sierra Leone, that President Kuruma has indeed succeeded. You voted him back into power on a knockout basis. No runoff. So you also realize that he's doing well, and you want him to do more of that. That is why it is my pleasure to be here, to talk to you about your important stars, to talk to you about what we plan to do, but to also tell you that President Kuruma has migrated from the agenda for change to the agenda for prosperity, Munafa, this time Monina Pockets. <laughs> the agenda for change was only for everybody, the roads, the life, this, and now, Agenda for Prosperity means we're going to create those jobs which will make people earn a living. <coughs> we're going to train the youth so that they have the skills to take the jobs that are coming. We're going to manage the mineral resources and the natural resources in the country in your interest. And we are going to ensure that uh, the health of the women and children is safeguarded in the country. So President Kuruma will bring the pork barrel home. This is an MCC occasion. It is not a political occasion. So far, I know you have got the message from President Kuhn. I know you are reassured that he's going to do the things that you know are important to you and your people back home. I know you sit here, but half of you is out there. 
You sleep with one eye open. You think about what's happening in Uberi Junction. You think of what is happening at Suleiman. You think of what's happening at uh, Koribu. You're worried about what happens to the people there. In fact, you have more worries than they. We go to sleep, we close our eyes, we know tomorrow that phone call will come. But I say, take this number. Go to Western Union. Go get the money. Make people buy rice. Make them put hours. I thank you very much for your attention. And remember, we are with you and we are with you. Thank you very much. Sierra.